In our number 10 spot, we have Operation London Bridge. Right away on the day of the Queen's passing, Operation London Bridge was to come into effect. Prime Minister Liz Truss would have received the news of Her Majesty's passing right away, and she would have been one of the first people to have been told. This message would have been delivered by the Queen's private secretary. The civil servants would have been notified next, and the media outlets, starting with the royal social media platforms. The flags would then be moved to half mast. Then the Ministry of Defense would do a gun salute, and a minute of silence would be taken around the country. The royal family zoomed into Balmoral to see the Queen just before she passed and were there by her side as she left us. The British people observed a double rainbow over Buckingham Palace that day. No thanks. In our number 9 spot today we have the Kensington system. Queen Victoria's reign began in 1837 and it lasted up until her death in 1901. She was just 18 years old when she found herself on the throne and it was all by chance as she was actually 5th in line when she was born. This is all stressful enough but certainly one of the worst parts of her upbringing was being brought up under the Kensington system. This means that her mother, Duchess Victoria of Kent, who created this system in order to control her daughter, literally just isolated her away from all of her friends and even from other family members, and apparently this was done to keep her quote unquote pure. The Duchess would monitor her every move. She would decide who she could see and who she could speak to. Victoria only had two friends she could play with growing up, one being her half sister and the other being her mother's attendant, Sir John Conroy. Victoria was even forced to share a room with her mother and until she was the queen, she couldn't even walk down the hall by herself. In the end, Victoria placed a lot of blame on John Conroy for manipulating her mother. She even called him the demon incarnate. In our number 8 spot today, we have money making. We obviously know that the British royal family is rich. It certainly isn't a surprise to any of us to hear that. I mean, they made a tax-free $97 million in 2017, so it's not like they're struggling by any stretch of the imagination. And while there are claims that most of their income comes from their private estates, and tourism, not everyone believes that this is the case. There are actually quite a few people who believe that the royal family costs British taxpayers a whopping $450 million a year. That's a ton of money. I truly do not know enough about anything to really choose a side, but it certainly is something to think about. I know with taxpayer money we pay a lot of salaries, and it's usually for a good reason, but $450 million is definitely next level. In our number 7 spot today we have the change of name. So for us here in Canada, Canada, later in May, we have a day called Victoria Day. We set off fireworks, people have barbecues, it's like one of those types of holidays. Back in 1819, Queen Victoria, of course, before she was queen, was christened in a mostly private ceremony. It was quite small, her uncle only let a few people come, and at the time of this christening, her name was Alexandrina Victoria. Apparently during this time period, the name Victoria wasn't looked at as a regal name. It had French origin and was almost unique at the time. So flash forward to when Queen Victoria is first taking the throne, she begins getting advised to change her name. They thought that it would give her a better public image if she had a more traditional name. Clearly, as the history books and our Canadian calendars show us, Queen Victoria said, yeah. No thanks, I'm not gonna do that. In our number 6 spot today we have the controversial history. The British royal family has quite a history of being perhaps less inclusive of others than would normally be accepted. There is actually quite an extensive history of racism in the royal family, and as we now know, especially after that Oprah interview last year, things haven't necessarily recently changed either. There have been certain gestures or small remarks made here and there that have definitely been a little out of touch, I'll call it. And unfortunately, Meghan Markle, being a biracial person had to experience a lot of it firsthand. I mean, just to give a few examples, Prince Philip did ask Indigenous Australians if they still throw spears at each other, okay? And once, Princess Michael of Kent tried to apologize after being called out for saying something racist, and this is what she said, quote, to call me racist. It's a knife through the heart because I really love these people. I even pretended years ago to be an African, a half caste African, but because of my light eyes, I did not get away with it. But I dyed my hair black. Okay, there is so much to unpack in that one sentence alone, but I have an extremely strong feeling that this apology probably wasn't well received, especially considering it lacked the whole 
apology part of an apology. In our number five spot today, we have Boy Jones. Okay, I've heard of people being called Boy Jones before, but little did I know Boy Jones was a very real and very creepy person. His full name was Edward Jones, and this little rascal basically stalked the queen from 1838 to 1841. He managed to break into Buckingham Palace, and we aren't just talking about once. No, we're talking about many, many times. He knew exactly where to go and what to do, and once in the castle, he would hide under the queen's sofa, he would sit on her throne, Wrong, and worst of all, he would go through her clothing. Like, what a little creep. He even went as far as to steal her clothes, which is just stupid. Of course, taking evidence of your crimes is just bad practice. Thankfully, he did finally get caught, but man, a few years of sneaking in and sitting on the throne? That's crazy. In our number four spot today, we have messy relationships. Joan of Kent lived during the 14th century in England, and she was known as being one of the most beautiful women in all of England. She was said to be quite loving, but it is also said that she had quite a whirlwind and controversial love life. So basically, Joan was only 12 when she had her first marriage. I know, horrifying now, but as was the practice at the time. She married a knight named Tom Holland, but when Tom went to war, Joan was approached by another man, the son of the Earl of Salisbury who asked for her hand in marriage. Despite the whole Tom situation, she said yes, because at this time, there was no way for anyone to know who would be coming back from battle, and she just assumed that Tom had died. It was, of course, quite the shock to everyone when Tom ended up returning, very much alive, to find out about all of this. A legal battle followed, which Tom ended up winning, and him and Joan went on to raise four children. After Tom's passing, however, Joan would go on to marry again, to the dismay of many people. This time, she would marry the son of King Edward III, and she went on to become the first Princess of Wales. In our number three spot today, we have royal affairs. There have been many, many rumors over the years about the British royal family and their extramarital affairs, and I'm saying that this goes way back. So far back that one of the first accusations of this within the royal family dates all the way back to King Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn. Since then, it has only continued with people such as Princess Margaret and Peter Townsend, Princess Anne and Commander Timothy Lawrence, and of course, Prince Charles and Camilla Parker Bowles just to name a few. The latter of those definitely being the most famous, especially when Prince Charles was confronted about it by his wife at the time, the beloved Princess Diana. Apparently, Charles responded to the confrontation by saying, quote, well, I refuse to be the only Prince of Wales who never had a mistress. Maybe not the attitude to keep when speaking to your wife who you're cheating on. I don't know, just a thought. In our number two spot today, we have Prince John. This one is said to possibly be one of the darkest secrets of the British royal family. Prince John would have been the uncle of Queen Elizabeth II, but he passed before she was born. Prince John was the sixth child of King George V and Queen Mary, and it is said that he suffered from seizures, likely as a result of epilepsy, although it's hard to diagnose for certain because of all of the secrecy surrounding him and his illness. From the age of four, when he had his first seizure until his untimely and early death, Prince John lived in a separate estate where he was cared for by a governess. Many people have since criticized the royal family, calling their treatment of Prince John as callous or inhumane like they were hiding him away for being ill. Of course, the palace was concerned with the monarchy's public image, and there was a belief at the time that royals shouldn't have any physical or mental ailments, although that of course is impossible. They also didn't include him in public events, which could have been another image thing, and also perhaps because of a worry that he might have a seizure at one of these events. At the end of the day, it was definitely a different time, but the idea of excluding him because he was ill truly is a very sad thought. In our number one spot today, we have the flag at half-mast. It is normal for a flag to be flown at half-mast following a great tragedy, so this certainly is not a dark tradition that the royal family has, but it's the time that they did not do this that is dark that I want to talk about today. After Princess Diana's death, people everywhere began mourning the loss, especially considering how young she was and how it all happened so quickly and unexpectedly. But the crazy thing, or I guess when you really think about it, the potentially sinister thing about it, is that the royal family just continued on as if nothing happened. Of course, business still needs to be conducted at times despite grief, but for many of them, there simply was no grief. The flag at Kensington Palace wasn't lowered to half-mast until the people complained about it, because they obviously felt like it was a slight to the princess. There were no public statements made until a day before her funeral, and there were many, many people who believed that if no one spoke up about this, that there may have never been any action taken by the family at all.
Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the rules of the road. This rule is probably one of the craziest things I've ever heard, but I guess it's been around for quite a while and I just had no idea. Turns out the monarch is the only person in the UK who is allowed to drive without a legal license or even license plates. I mean, what? That's so insane. I didn't expect the king to have to take a driver's test like everyone else, but just having a rule that allows them, if they chose, to drive without any idea how? It truly is just absolutely bizarre. The good news is though, which makes this rule make a lot more sense, is that of course, rather than driving himself, King Charles' chauffeur will be much more responsible for most of the driving for the king. Let's just hope the chauffeur has their driver's license. In our number 9 spot, we have King Charles' first step. The day after the Queen passed, right away it was instructed that Prince Charles will be sworn in as the new sovereign by the Accession Council. This means that he will be proclaimed king until his coronation or until he decides to step down and give the throne to his eldest son, Prince William. If all goes well, this should happen the morning after the Queen's death at 10am. His title will change to King Charles III. In our number 8 spot, we have the Accession Council and further title changes. The second part of the Accession Council is attended by the King and other senior royals. For the first time in history, we will get to see this centuries old ritual because it will be broadcasted live. So cool. Most of us alive today wouldn't have been around or old enough to have witnessed the Queen's coronation, so this is very exciting. Prince William, the next in line to the throne after King Charles, will be given the new title of Duke of Cornwall, and Kate will become Duchess of Cornwall, replacing Camilla, who technically becomes queen, but she will be given the title of queen consort, a wish made by Queen Elizabeth before she passed. His title will change to King Charles III. This day has also since passed and I must say I am actually surprised that King Charles didn't decide to pass the crown on to his son. I think a lot of the British people expected him to, but in any case, Prince William will eventually have his day as king. Following the accession council, the king will return to Buckingham Palace to meet with the senior politicians and church leaders. In our number 7 spot, we have Operation Unicorn. Since the Queen passed away at Balmoral, the family has strict instructions upon returning her to Buckingham Palace. This is called Operation Unicorn. Operation Unicorn will be activated and it will mean that the Queen's coffin will be transported to London via royal train. If Operation Unicorn fails, then a new operation takes effect and that is Operation Overstudy. This is a strict instruction for the coffin to then be transported by plane. The Prime Minister and Ministers will welcome the coffin upon arrival at Buckingham Palace. In our number 6 spot, we have D-Day plus 3. D-Day represents death day, so about 3 days after the death day, Charles will receive the motion of condolence at Westminster Hall, and then he will begin his tour of the United Kingdom as the new king. He has been instructed to attend a service in Northern Ireland at St. Anne's Cathedral in Belfast. In our number 5 spot, we have the rehearsal plus D-Day plus 5. While King Charles III is on his tour, a rehearsal for Operation Lion will be taking place. Operation Lion is when the Queen's coffin will be carried from Buckingham Palace to the Palace of Westminster. This will be around D-Day plus 5. When the coffin arrives, a service will be held in Westminster Hall. In our number 4 spot, we have D-Day plus 6 to D-Day plus 9. Operation Feather is now going to be in effect. Such interesting titles. I wonder if the Queen chose them herself. When I die, I'm going to leave strict instructions from my loved ones and call it Operation Magical Fairy. <laughs> Instead of taking my coffin on a tour, I shall instruct my family to go on a tour around the world with my ashes. I better start saving them so they can do that. <laughs> they definitely don't have a royal budget to complete this wish. Anyways, back to Operation Feather. It states that for the next three days, the coffin will stay at Westminster and the Queen will lie in state so visitors can come to pay their respects. The coffin will be placed on a raised box and will be available for 23 hours a day for those three days. I would have thought that it would only have been for select people such as friends, family, and politicians, but apparently anyone can visit. There is expected to be about 10,000 plus people, so I would leave now to line up. <laughs> I bet you the line is going to be insane, like standing in Times Square on New Year's. There probably won't be anywhere to move. I wish I lived in England. I would definitely have gone to pay my respects. The public will be able to pay their respects as of September 14th, 2022. 
In our number three spot, we have more traveling for King Charles. King Charles is expected to travel to Wales during this time to receive a third motion of condolence at the Welsh Parliament. This is projected to happen around D Day plus seven. The king will also attend a service at Llandaff Cathedral in Cardiff. Also, during this time, the rehearsals for the funeral will be taken place. On the morning of September the 19th, 2022, in our number two spot, we have the funeral. The funeral for Queen Elizabeth II will be held at Westminster Abbey. Processions will take place in London and Windsor, and a committal service will take place at St. George's Chapel at Windsor Castle. The Queen is to be buried in the castle's King George VI Memorial Chapel. There will be a two minute silence at midday in the country. Before she passed, the Queen agreed that her funeral day would be a a day of national mourning, and so it effectively became a bank holiday. Apparently, though, if the funeral falls on a weekday, the government does not plan to order businesses to let their employees have a day off. The businesses can individually decide on this, though. In our number one spot, we have mourning plus the king's official coronation. Following the funeral, the country will go into a period of mourning. Even though King Charles would have automatically become king when the queen passed, his official coronation will not take place for some time. It is predicted predicted to be months later or as late as a year after. Queen Elizabeth had her coronation more than a year after she had been ruling. The delay is most likely due to the fact that there will be an enormous amount of planning for the event that will need to take place. The ceremony will most likely take place at Westminster Abbey as it has done for the last 900 years. It will be done most likely by the Archbishop of Canterbury as it has been done since year 1066. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have King King Charles the first. Okay, so this is one that goes way back and it really creeps me out. So King Charles the first was tried for treason after the Civil War and he ended up being beheaded in 1649. I guess in the 1600s everyone was beheaded so this wasn't necessarily abnormal which certainly is weird but that's a history lesson for another day. The weird part however is that apparently his head was sewn back on his body so that he could sit for a portrait or it was perhaps supposed to be a sign of respect. Either way, it's weird and very gross. I feel terrible for whoever's job it was to do that, and I also feel bad for the artist who was forced to paint that. Talk about a little traumatic. It does certainly make sense though that people say that Charles' ghost still haunts a building because there is no amount of haunting that could make up for being beheaded and then having your head sewn back onto your body. In our number nine spot today, we have the armed forces. One of the most intimidating parts of his new role is that King Charles will now become the head of the armed forces. This means that it is his responsibility Ability, and he is the only person who can declare when the country is at war and when the war is over. Of course, he won't be doing this entirely alone. He needs to follow the advice and guidance of the government. Can't just randomly declare war. The perhaps good news is that the new king has held quite close ties to the armed forces throughout his life, even spending time in the Royal Navy and taking flying instruction from the Royal Air Force during his second year at Cambridge University. Of course, the hope is that he won't be in a position to make these difficult decisions, but when or if he's facing with them, we can hope he makes the proper decisions for the country. In our number eight spot today, we have the church. King Charles won't only be the head of the armed forces, but he will also become the head of the church in England. Quite a jump from talking about war and being the one who makes those kinds of decisions to being the head of the church where things are hopefully quite the opposite, more peaceful. This is a post that British monarchs have held since the church was founded by King Henry VIII in the 1500s, and it appears as though the tradition will carry on. In this role, it means that King Charles will be responsible responsible for appointing archbishops and bishops to their role. The king will be, of course, advised in this role by the prime minister. It is said that the king is religious in his own right and that he has already spoken about how his personal faith has informed his approach to leadership. In our number seven spot today, we have gifts. The king has a duty to accept all of the gifts he receives, and not only that, but he has to accept them graciously. Apparently, it is actually quite customary for the royal family to receive every gift that is handed to them during royal engagements. Of course, people are always wanting to gift the royal family things, but like the queen once had the power to do, it is now up to King Charles who in the family is allowed to keep the gifts they've been given. That would be a super strange meeting, but hey, there are some weird rules the royal family has to follow. In our number six spot today, we have never travel in pairs. This is one travel rule that certainly makes sense, but it is quite dark when you really think about it. This rule is 
says that any heirs to the throne are not allowed to travel together, which means that the king is going to be traveling differently than he once used to. This is of course in case some sort of accident happens, not every heir to the throne would be injured or perhaps killed. It's definitely very smart and very sensible, but it has got to be grim just constantly preparing for the worst thing to happen. It is of the utmost importance to the royal family that they preserve the line to the throne. This travel rule is actually becoming more frequent among even other people outside of the royal family who can afford this type of luxury. In our number 5 spot today we have the black outfit. Another travel rule that the family must follow is in regards to an item they must bring with them. It is unusual to see the royal family dressed in black despite when a specific occasion calls for it, but every time they travel they are required to bring an all black outfit with them. This is again to prepare for the worst case scenario. If they are away on a trip and someone important passes away, they need to ensure that they are ready with the appropriate clothing for when they are able to touch down on their home soil. This is pretty practical, but also definitely pretty morbid. I mean, imagine having to fuss over what you're going to wear when you're actually just mourning the loss of someone close to you. Certainly wouldn't be the top of my list for me, but clearly I am no royal. In our number 4 spot today, we have no touching. There is a rule that you just cannot touch a royal. I'm sure there are a multitude of reasons for this, most to do with security, but aside from a lucky handshake, you really are supposed to keep your distance. I suppose it's because I live the life of a regular person, but I feel like that would be so sad. I feel like you'd be lacking in so much connection with a ton of interesting people, and wouldn't you just be dying to hug some of the nice people you meet? Maybe that's just the Canadian in me. Apparently this is part of the reason why the queen always wore gloves. She of course shook a lot of hands while out making her royal appearances, and the same will likely go for the new king. Maybe he'll take up gloves as a fashion accessory, just like his mother. In our number 3 spot today we have the dinner choices. There are plenty of strange rules when it comes to royal dinner etiquette, but this one might be the most strange. I'm not exactly sure if King Charles enjoyed much seafood during his time as the Prince of Wales, but if he did, those days might be coming to an end rather soon. Apparently the palace recommends that his highness not indulge in shellfish. No shrimp, no lobster, you get the idea. This is meant to be for his safety, of course, because apparently it is believed that shellfish causes food poisoning more than any other type of food, so unfortunately the king won't be heading to the local Red Lobster anytime soon. In our number 2 spot today we have no autographs. This is a rule that the king won't be much of a stranger to as it's a rule for the entire royal family. Of course, in this day and age, people often ask their favorite celebrities for autographs or more likely now, a selfie, but the royal family isn't allowed to stop for these kinds of interactions. For autographs, it makes a ton of sense. It's a safety measure to ensure that no forgers can learn to mimic the handwriting of royalty. I totally understand that. For selfies, it's less of an official rule and more just to do with etiquette. When meeting a member of royalty, it is important to never turn your back on them, so asking the new king to squeeze in behind you for a photo would definitely be discouraged. An act of admiration might just have the new king feeling a little bit slighted. In our number one spot today, we have opinions. This is probably my favorite of all of the rules we have today, which is exactly why I saved it for the number one spot. During the king's time as the Prince of Wales, Charles has certainly been known for having quite a vocal approach to different social issues and whatever the current affairs have been. He's an outspoken individual and that doesn't always sit well with people. Fair enough, but now that he's the king, he does have some different expectations. He is now expected to not make his constituents feel uncomfortable or alienated, which means that he won't be allowed to be such a champion of certain issues. This basically means that the king needs to keep some more of his opinions to himself, which I'm sure is going to make some people happy. 